Well, hello. It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks I've been using throughout the week. And this week is a special Pens on the Road um, and Prairie Trails and so on. So stick around to the end and find out about that. So let's dive into the pens. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And hey, I just want to say, um, do you explore the history and interesting spots in your own backyard? Because I don't care where you live. I'm in rural North Dakota. So, you know, if I can find them, you can find them. Are you appreciating where you live and exploring what you have? Let us know down in the comments. So let's take a look at some pens. All right, so these are the pens that I've been using this week and the last couple of weeks. So I have a Romus Majestic, which you saw. Actually, you saw these first two pens with Parker Quink Washable Blue. Now you get to see them with something else. I have a Lintz Brown pen. I have, let's just zoom in a little tiny bit more because I can. There we go. I have an Aurora 88, the modern version. I have a Cross Townsend, Cross Wanderlust, Parker Sonnet, which has taken over as my daily writer for till it runs out of ink, Lamy 2000, Broad, because the fine is taking a hibernation for the summer, a Pelican Twist, which you haven't seen on here in a long time, but I just for fun decided to ink it up, Aurora Dual Cart, and a Platinum President. As always, I'll be doing my writing sample in this Cognitive Surplus Seafood Flavored Journal. All right, so the first pen is this Romus Majestic. Uh, somebody in the comments mentioned that they'd seen this pen on Stephen Brown's channel as a Indian manufacturer. Uh, as far as I know, this one is German. I have the feeling that uh, an Indian manufacturer has purchased the name because the pen, of course, is quite different. So this is a Romus Majestic. Uh, I won't be doing any more Hiroshizuku Tsukushi because I ran out. So this ink is, let me look here. Oops, I'm on the wrong page. There we go. Hiroshizuku something else. My pen list is totally wrong. <laughs> Hiroshizuku Yamaguri, how about that? Which is a dark brown, obviously. Uh, I'm trying to decide if I need to dial down the exposure. I wish I had a better preview screen. I think that's good enough. So anyway, Hiroshizuku Yamaguri. Some of these pens that you're going to see tonight, probably not this one, but some of the others I've uh, not been writing with just so I'd have them to write with in this video. And then I don't get the pens in use made and it's just been awkward. So uh, glad I've got more free time now. But anyway, just kind of a plain ordinary brown ink and uh, one that when I use it up, I won't bother replacing. This pen is my Lintz Brown pen. I actually wore this to graduation. And as I'm writing a couple notes on the on the you know the little program that they hand out at graduation, I looked at my hand. It's not the case anymore, of course. But I looked at my hand; and it was covered with green ink. I finally figured out it was leaking from around here, because I, of course, had been storing the pen upside down in my pocket, and you can see a little bit of ink there. Still, it's dried on, but uh, apparently the piston does not seal perfectly, so. Uh, I'll have to decide if that's worth fixing because if you remember, and I need to do some more videos in it, but my attempt at uh, repair videos, uh, my first principle was first do no harm. If I can get this pen to write and not leak, just not carry it upside down in my pocket, isn't that good? So the ink in it is Roar and Klingner Alt Goldgrim. Forget the umlaut. 
Kind of an enjoyable pen. In fact, this is its second fill of Old Gold Groon. I, uh, you know, I inked it up once and then I didn't get around to filming that pen's in use because of life events. And uh, it ran empty and I'm like, no, I want to write some more with it. So I inked it up again. So we're on the second fill. I do have a shirt with a lot of Old Gold Groon in it, which... Uh, I can't remember looking if it washed out of it or not, so I'll have to do that. Uh, my third pen, almost empty, Aurora 88. I prefer the vintage version, but uh-oh. Like I said, a couple of these pens I haven't been writing with because I wanted to save them for this video. But maybe I should have just reduced the number of pens because I can see the ink window. It's almost empty. So let's just do um, the 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 piston is actually designed to fit over the feed. You can kind of see the bit of the feed there sticking up, so you can get just a few more drops of ink out of this pen. So I just ran the piston down. We'll see what happens here. Oh yeah. Trouble with that feature is it makes it a little harder to clean, but I think the idea was, you know, you're writing, you're somewhere else, and you're just like, oh, shoot, now what? Uh, so this is a flex nib, and the ink in it is something orange. It's a Roshizuku, anyway. A Roshizuku something orange. Okay, Roshizuku Fuyugaki. How could I forget that? So, uh, I've just lately emptied several Roshizuku bottles. You know, I, from time to time I mention my goal of reducing my ink collection. Uh, these Roshizuku bottles are small, so they're easy victories. But the important thing is, they open up space. Especially if I don't buy any more ink, and I can get down to what is my favorite orange, what is my favorite green or two or three, and just focus. My next pen is a Parker Townsend. Sorry, Cross Townsend. I like this finish on it, even though it's very gimmicky with the, I think that's Ferrari. Yep, says Ferrari on the pen. Uh, it's gimmicky, but who cares? It was actually cheaper to buy this gimmicky pen than to buy a real Cross Townsend that's not anything branded. So, this is a medium nib, and the ink in it is De Atramentis. Apple Blossom. And, uh... It smells absolutely nothing like apple blossoms, but it does have a little bit of a smell. Uh, two friends of mine came down with COVID this week, so I've been kind of scared that, what if I get it? But my sense of smell and taste seem to be intact. So it's good that even around friends, I'm basically antisocial. <laughs> so maybe I just didn't get close enough to catch it, or maybe they caught it somewhere not even related to me. Okay, I love this pen, but uh, it's not enjoying the ink that's in it right now. So this is a Cross Wonderlust, has an Antelope Canyon finish, and it's a place I'd absolutely love to visit. And someday I will. You know, I'll have the house paid off in two or three years. I uh, might wait a couple years till I you know, till the car market settles down and buy a nicer car, but I do want to do some traveling again. Since gas prices might hit $5 this summer, I feel like I won't be doing much traveling other than locally, which is fun because uh, this video later in this video we're going to talk about some local travels. And, uh, hey, at least the oil companies are making record profits. 
So somebody's winning at high oil, high gas prices. All right, so Diamine Damson is a nice dark purple. Another ink that it's a small bottle, and uh, honestly, when it runs empty, I probably won't bother replacing it. And I just realized you didn't see most of that, so there we go. This has been my daily writer. When it runs empty, I'll, I'll replace it with a different pen. But I like this because it's, you know, slip cap like a Lamy 2000, and it writes a good line. So this is a Parker Sonnet. It has a fine nib in it. And the ink in it, of course, is Parker Quink, not washable blue. Parker Quink, black. For many years, this was my ink. And you know, as I've been trying to empty out this bottle, because yeah, I know I can empty this bottle and probably another bottle of black ink of some kind this year, I have uh, rediscovered the joys of Parker Quink black. Is it the most exciting black? No. But I like it. It writes well. So who knows, after I use up all my black ink, what ink I will return to. I do have a little less than a liter of uh, Pelican black to use up, so there is that. All right, Lamy 2000. The fine point one is on vacation, but I can use the broad, and I have, I feel like I have another one. So this is a Lummy 2000. The broad nib and the ink in it is Noodlers. Black Swan in Australian no, Black Swan in Australian Rose. Uh, Nathan Tardiff always has interesting bottles and interesting ink names. Sometimes he gets himself in trouble. Um, and that's a risky run when you put your beliefs and politics on your sleeve. But anyway, it's it's a it is a very nice color. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I like it in an ink or in a pen that is wet enough to show some shading. Because you know, by itself it's a it's a nice color. It's the shading that really makes it work for me. This pen, I, I tried out a couple kids' pens. You know, this one is a children's pen because it's got stuff designed so if they swallow parts, they don't choke up to death on them. And it's designed to train grips. Uh, I don't like the twisted grip. I mean, the tripod grip is kind of condescending anyway. But anyway, it's a Petticon twist. Oh, almost empty. See, now, my Lamy ABC wouldn't do that. Okay, not just almost empty. It is empty. Never mind. I've already done that part. I just apparently didn't take it out for cleaning. Then I have my Aurora Duo Cart. Which is... Uh, Sort of the poor man's version of the original Aurora 88. So the Aurora Duo Cart. Contains, oh it's a medium nib. Contains Iroshizuku. Amairo. Which is kind of a nice sky blue type of color. Um, one blue that will be in my collection when I finally get my ink collection down is going to be a blue like this. Now whether it's this, Lamy Turquoise, Monteverde Turquoise, and whatever the other one is that I have that's this color. Oh, it's a Roar and Klingner. Um, one of them will be in my collection. And finally, I have the Platinum President, a pen which is no longer made, which is a shame, because it is a good pen. Now you can only get this nib on the much more expensive Platinum Izumo. I think that was my fault. 
Platinum President. I had uh, it ground to a cursive italic, so it's a broad cursive italic nib. So cursive italics are kind of particular about your direction, which is why I said that was probably my fault. Uh, the ink in it is Colorverse, and you can kind of see there the horizontals are very thin, the verticals are very thick, but it has Colorverse Golden Record. Another bottle that's almost empty. So I'm going to be emptying a lot of bottles of ink in the next month or two, which is an exciting feeling of progress to me because, uh, oops, this is supposed to be vertical. I I said I really want to reduce the size of my ink collection and I just kind of amazed that over the years I let it get this big. So a couple of years of not buying ink has been helping me slowly reduce the collection size. So those are the inks that I've been using this week and the pens. And last week and the week before and probably a couple pens got emptied out in the meantime but Hey, I'm back. So, there we go. So, I have uh, ended my school year. I've had a busy time and a distracting time. And uh, Pens and Use really hasn't been coming out too much. But now I'm on summer break, so it should <laughs> become more regular. And uh, But this one was delayed because... I knew I was doing something on Saturday that I thought would be fun to share. So I delayed it intentionally. And uh, yeah, I could have put it in next week's, but whatever. I wanted it in this week's. I just thought, you know, I wouldn't be quite as tired when I got done with my day. And I thought I'd finish it up on Saturday, but nope. I was tired. So uh, I'm finishing it up here on Sunday morning. But anyway. So June 4th, which would have been yesterday... I took a tour with the Pioneer Tra uh, Trails Museum, which is located in Bowman, North Dakota, a small town in southwestern North Dakota. Um, it was mostly a historical, slightly scientific tour. Uh, they, they do this every year. Uh, but anyway, it's a tour using uh, ATVs because it went into some remote territory. Uh, they, the, most of what we were riding on were what were called side-by-sides, which is kind of like an enclosed ATV. I was in a very nice side-by-side, <laughs> -side, actually. I don't own one. They cost too much for me. But, you know, some of the landowners generously allowed us to uh, tour their land, so we were able to get back into some unique territory. Uh, but definitely required... ATV type technology because the Toyota Camry would not have made it back into these places. <laughs> uh, and of course the drivers were instructed to remain on the trail and follow in a line to minimize damage to the land. Because <laughs> you do have to think about the environment and uh, these types of vehicles can be an erosion problem which is why people don't want them just driving everywhere. And there was a person who followed at the end of the street uh, trail of ATVs to make sure all gates were closed because again respect for the landowner uh, So we started by visiting the town of Bessie Which is no longer exists. You can't even find a foundation there. There is no hint that this town exists Turns out I know the wife of a man who used to hang out in Bessie quite a bit um, And I taught his grandson so <laughs> but uh, Bessie is no longer there. It's buried under a ranch um, once had stores and houses, and they'd hoped for the railroad to come through, and they even actually contended with Amadon for the Slope County seat. So a lot of what we did, we'd stop at different places, and then we had we were kind of divided up into groups, and we'd have somebody speaking. Uh, they were doing a lot of reading, mainly because the guy who was supposed to do a lot of the talking was really, really sick, and uh, so you know he <laughs> he got some people that. You know, it helped set up the trip, but really weren't public speakers to do it all. And uh, <laughs> it was, uh, they did well. You know, they were knowledgeable, but not public speakers. Moved back to Springfield, Illinois. James Burke's brother, Henry Burke, came with his brother to North Dakota in May 10th, 1907, and homesteaded adjacent to him in the south half of Section 11, 133. 
And, you know, that's okay. We're not all public speakers. But they, they were definitely good readers and definitely very knowledgeable. And when you'd start talking to them, when they're not reading, you know, suddenly they'd come alive. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm going to share little bits and pieces from their reading, but uh, not the whole thing. Because they're not asking to be on YouTube. So, just little bits and pieces. Uh, so, anyway, many of these towns are gone, like Bessie. Some of them may have a single remaining building. Some of them are just a shell of their former selves. Uh, in the past, I've taken you to Haley, North Dakota, so I'll put a link to that down below. Uh, I also am going to put a link to a website called Ghost Towns of North Dakota, where these, uh, it was two people who just went around North Dakota for a long time. They've quit doing it now. Uh, but they went around North Dakota photographing all the different small towns. And by small, I mean ghost towns where hardly anybody's left. Uh, they never visited Bessie, but there's nothing there to see except a family's ranch and, you know, private property and all that. So that's not on their list. Um, but, you know, the thing is, these are towns, a lot of them were waiting for the railroad to come. Railroad never came. Uh, when I took you to Haley, Haley was sure they were on the route the railroad was going to come through. Too far south. Bessie was sure they were on the route the railroad was going to come through, too far north. My town uh, is one of the towns that was on the route the railroad took, and that's why it's still alive today. Uh, so, the, so we went on to a site near Black Butte. Black Butte? That's Black Butte. In the old maps, it's called H.T. Butte. Where we learned about a landslide in one of the buttes. Actually, uh, journal entries from people at that time reveal that it was apparently quite loud, and some even claimed that it was a volcano, which North Dakota geology, no, it was not a volcano. But uh, the evidence remains to this day of the landslide, and it explains the weird shape of the butte. And I learned, uh, thanks to a former student, that apparently the kids around here have a very crude name for this butte, which I won't get into. 1930s, it was actually just a landslide that caused a big rumble, but it caused a big uh, commotion between the neighbors. Some thought it was volcanic, stuck by it, but it was volcanic. It was a landslide. There were some actually disputes over between the neighbors up here. <laughs> But the, the, the butte is slick. That small one. Straight south of the butte. Straight south of the butte. So then we, uh, while we were there, we talked a little bit about kind of the people that were in this area. I am totally missing a page. Oh, I am not missing this page. I just put it in the wrong spot. Um, so one of the things that came up a lot was some of the wealthy people that lived in the area. Uh, people that were big, huge, huge, huge ranchers and very wealthy. So uh, one of the things that would have been big at that same time would have been cattle rustling, which means literally stealing cattle. You know, why do you brand cattle? It's cruel. Well, there's a really good reason why they brand cattle, because people steal them. And here's this evidence on the cow's actual flesh saying, nope, that's my cow. Um, so in the days of cattle rustling, there was a lot of vigilante justice. In fact, uh, we talked a little bit about a book called uh, 12 Quiet Men, which I put a link to it down in the video description. I have not read it, but it was about some uh, vigilantes who were hired to work in this area to end the cattle rustling. And uh, vigilante is just as scary as it sounds. These are people that just take the law into their own hands. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, The Oxbow Incident, which do both, by the way, uh, that's a book that came out and a movie that came out right at the beginning of the first, Second World War, which was uh, controversial at the time because it wasn't one of these rah-rah patriotism type of movies or books. It was more, well, a lot deeper and more complicated. But anyway, it was all about uh, vigilante justice. They end up hanging 
some people who turn out to be innocent. And they don't know that until afterward. So, uh, you know, cattle rustling was definitely a thing back then and uh, quite a big deal. Now, uh, we then went off-road, and this was one of the places I wouldn't have taken the Camry. <laughs> um, actually, even one of the roads we drove on to get to the off-road part, I wouldn't have taken the Camry. Uh, but anyway, we, we, en we went on to learn about an interesting homesteader. It was a woman named Mrs. Maddox, who end up, ended up chasing off her husband because he just wasn't good for much. So she pretty much ran the place. And she is also known, and I'll put a, I put a link to this in the video description, for making a buckskin shirt for Theodore Roosevelt, who later became president. Back then he was a young man who'd just lost his wife and was, uh, well, he, he was trying to be a tough, learn, you know, learn to be a frontiersman, and so he'd come out to North Dakota for several years, which uh, I might have to do a video on that sometime, but... He considers North Dakota part of the formative part of his uh, development. Anyway, but he got this Mrs. Maddox to make him a buckskin jacket, which apparently is something she was quite good at. And there are some famous photographs of him in that jacket. Uh, we also discussed the several waves of settlement here in North Dakota. Uh, settlement and the military action was used to steal the land, because let's be honest... We stole it. Uh, the first to come were the large ranchers, which I mentioned already. They used the open range to graze huge, huge, huge herds of cattle and horses. Um, but then during the homesteading era, they began to close up and sell out as the homesteaders moved in. Now, Hollywood, but movies like Shane or The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance kind of give the Hollywood interpretation of that transitional era. Uh, I won't say accurate, but definitely give you some idea of the issues that were going on then. Uh, so these early settlers came to a land that lacked even enough wood to build a cabin. And no trains yet to bring the wood in. Um, so you'll he you, I'm sure you've all heard of sod houses, which are... You know, houses literally made of sod, like cut up the grass and stack it like bricks. And, of course, they heated with dried buffalo chips, which, yes, buffalo poop. I know they're bison. Uh, and that sounds harsh. The reality was even harsher. Many of these homesteaders started in dugouts. Uh, these are places, these would just be built into a hillside or whatever. And uh, I want you to think Hobbit Hole. Just not as nice. They were damp and dark. Uh, the benefit of them is they really only needed one side to be built to shelter them. Um, now, a major problem with this area, and I know where we were was uh, an exception, which is why Mrs. Maddox was able to make a go of it there. Oh, and there were geese. It's hatched out. But a major problem with the area was, honestly, the lack of water. And uh, it is an arid climate here. So water rights and access could mean the difference between life and death to a homesteader. And uh, I've talked about that. I've got a book review on, what was it called? Cadillac Desert, uh, which gives a much larger, more only limited North Dakota discussion of the water. Uh, and still a problem today in the West, by the way. And starting to show up in places like Lake Mead and Lake Powell and in California. But anyway, uh, another major problem for these people was isolation. You are cut off. You know how I'm talking to you on YouTube right now and, uh, and I want to call Mom Pa Squirrel. I just whip out the old phone. Uh, I have a landline, but I just discovered I can't dial out on it. So uh, I think the landline is going because I'm probably going to have to replace the phone. It's like, uh, get rid of landline, replace phone. Which one's cheaper? Yep, yeah, getting rid of the landline. But anyway, we're very connected in this 21st century world you and I live in. Back then, you are shut off. Could be your homesteader's wife 
Hubby may be the only person you see for months until you have a whole brood of kids who will be your life for months. That's all you see. You are on your own if stuff breaks, if you run out of food, if somebody is sick, you are on your own. So you think about how these people were living into the 20th century. This was a hard, hard life. And I don't think most of us really appreciate it, including me. I mean, I intellectually I get it, but honestly, I don't get it because I'm not living that world. Now, on the way to our next destination, we stopped at the side of Highway 85 to see a post that commemorated an old cattle drive. So I'll let uh, one of our presenters talk about it. About this, this, this was taken on by the Rotary Clubs, and this is to commemorate the cattle trails coming from Texas up here, uh, Great Northern, the Green Western Trail. Uh, they got them all along 85 here. And there's one of the tourism with the Bowman there and right at the sail barn. And if you watch, they're off the side of the road here. But it's just a history to remember the cattle drives coming up in North Dakota. And the Rotary Clubs, and I was hoping Ron Falcheski would be here. He, he's the one that got to talk, but he never showed up today. I don't know what happened. But I think the Rotary Clubs in this part of the country from Texas all the way up to here have taken it off as a project to mark the trail every so many miles. Hey, and there's, a, there's a plaque in the one in Bowman. Right. And one at the state line. Yep. Right. yep. One at the state line. They turn it off and they're going at the south of the border. And then we've had lunch at the top of the Chalky Buttes. They're green right now. There are some summers that they are white, like chalk, because of the clay. Uh, but this year, thanks to two blizzards, we have enough moisture that grass is actually growing on them. So they're not chalky this year. But uh, anyway, you can see how high up we are because I'll show you here a video I took from the chalkies looking down on Highway 85. And I've got an arrow pointing to a semi that's traveling along Highway 85. Uh, and that's one of the troubles I have. I, I enjoy landscape photography. But I usually do it in places like the Black Hills or the Cave Hills or Slim Buttes or even the Badlands because it's just so hard to get a scale here. You don't have trees to give scale. You don't have enough human habitation. So you just don't have that scale for how big it is. So it just doesn't come off right. Uh, while we are at the top of the Chalkies, we learn more about the military action in the area. This actually intersected with a visit I paid to Slim Butte uh, down in South Dakota, where in my video I talked about the massacre of uh, a native village there, kind of in the post uh, Little Bighorn era. But uh, the soldiers actually came near the Chalkies. They were more on the side of Rainy Butte, which is kind of far off in the distance, but they were starving. Uh, they were sometimes called horse soldiers because they were actually killing their horses just for food. Um, there was also a little bit of talk during this about ghost dancing and uh, threats from the in, from the natives who had been pushed onto reservations. Uh, with the ghost dancing, the whole, that, was, that was sweeping all the reservations. The whole idea was that if they do it right, the white man will disappear and the buffalo will come back. And I'm going to be doing a video soon. It was supposed to be one of these weeks where I skipped pens and use. But uh, about the Indian boarding schools, there's a whole process of starting back in the 1800s where we were trying to just extinguish that culture. Uh, so I'll get into that in another week. But anyway, I, I just thought as an interesting side note, so last summer, just then, this, so this isn't on the tour, last summer, I was up north uh, on the interstate and I stopped in a town called Hebron, so no, Hebron, North Dakota. And in Hebron, at the highest spot in Hebron, there's a place called Fort Sauerkraut. Now, the one that's there is a replica. It's not the original. But what Fort Sauerkraut is, 
it was uh, hastily made of earth and railroad ties on the tallest point in Hebron. People sheltered there in fear because they had heard that the uh, natives were coming off of the reservations and were killing every white person they could find. The ghost dancing had built up that fear and then the rumors just got started and yeah, they didn't have social media then to get things spread really quickly, but they sure had their ways, and there was no way for anybody to fact check because uh, it took too long. So they were just terrified that the Native Americans were going to come and kill them all. So they built this fort out of sod and uh, railroad ties at the top of this hill, and they waited in fear, cowered inside this thing, and then people are like, well, i got to get back to my farm and... Uh, you know, got a farm, you know, and make money and support my family and stuff. And uh, it just kind of petered out and nothing happened. So, uh, but there was a lot of military action, just uh, not at Fort Sauerkraut. <laughs> so back to the tour. Let's go back to the Chalkies. Meanwhile. So uh, after we uh, had lunch there at the top of the Chalkies, um, which you might have noticed I got a little bit of sun. I've got kind of got red arms too. And I'm wearing long sleeves today because it's cold today and raining. So I'm not working in my garden, which I should be doing. But anyway, uh, so then we crossed over to White Butte, which is the highest point in North Dakota, which is 3,506 feet above sea level, or for those of you on a more rational measurement system, 1,069 meters. And it rises uh, 426 feet above the surrounding landscape. And among highest points in all states, it ranks 31st. To my surprise, North Dakota doesn't have the lowest peak of all the states. I forgot which one does, but uh, it's not North Dakota. So we had special access, which isn't normally available to the public. You know, we were on private land at this point. Um, so I have been up White Butte, which is on private land, but there's a kind of an agreement that there's a public way to get in and a trail and stuff, but uh, this was a private way in, so that was kind of cool. But we were able to go to the top and take pictures. Um, it is an impressive view. And again, really hard to capture, as I explained. Anyway, so then we went out through the public access entrance. It is greatly improved since I last climbed White Butte, which is one of my first videos, and I put a link to that down below. Uh, in fact, the little numbers you're seeing, I want to be getting back into doing the driving videos soon, so that's, those are kind of my little footnotes. Uh, the last stop on this tour was the Stewart Lake Wildlife Reserve. Now, normally you're not supposed to go on those, but uh, apparently we'd been given special access because we went in. And it was created in the 1930s as a recreational area. There's still a place for cooking fires. And it even has a wind shelter. Because uh, we, you know, it took us a while. To, we, we didn't know till our speaker told us what was going on there. Because it was like, is that the foundation of a house? No. And it just was, made no sense till he explained it. Uh, there's also a bandstand there. One time there had been a beach, a playground, and a dancing area. There were plans for cabins and housing for a permanent caretaker. The lake did have some problems. It was about nine feet deep, <laughs> so it would have algal blooms and things. Uh, but it fell into disrepair due to flooding. And then, and of course, in the 1940s, events in Europe and uh, in the Pacific took over our national attention, and uh, attention went elsewhere rather than to this little man-made lake in North Dakota. So since then, it's become a wildlife reserve. But I just want to mention, this. so there is a lot to see where you live. And a lot of history. 
I'm in southwestern North Dakota. Not exactly a high point of excitement in U U.S. scenery or history, but uh, there's a lot of it here. Um, this tour, this particular tour, covered mostly settler history, but it's worth noting that there were thousands of years of history before that. They just didn't have white skin. Um, one story that they were they told us on this trip took place near the Chalkies. Uh, it was about a battle between the Sioux and the Crow that took place. And one of these days, kind of to the south of here, I need to talk about the story of Crow Buttes. Um, yes, you can go to Europe and see cathedrals, ancient cathedrals. You can go see ruins in Greece. You can see Mayan temples in Mexico. Um, all over the world you can find ancient stuff. But there's also a lot of history where you live. And sometimes it's just the tales of the small people that lived in that collapsed house out in the country. Or why do we call this Frank Street? Or whatever. You know, you, you, you find history locally as well. It may not be grand armies marching, but it's the story of people who built the place where you live. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to learn about the area where you live. Um, explore it. Enjoy it. Yes, I love visiting other places. But I've also learned to enjoy the place where I'm at. And I would encourage you to do that as well. So, if videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. Hey, what do you do to learn about the history in your area? Or are you that one person who lives in an area with no interesting history or scenery? Let us know down in the comments. Maybe you just don't care about your local history or scenery. Anyway, I want to thank you for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.